the line. How may I help you? Just calling to let you know that we've got a, a leaky tank. Can you tell me what the material is? Uh, MCHM. MCHM? Is it going into a creek or a stream? Uh, we don't anticipate it going into the river. Uh -huh. West Virginia was in the midst of the largest drinking water crisis in recent U.S. history. National news had been covering the chaos, but no one knew why this had happened. President Obama approved a disaster declaration for West Virginia. Nine counties are dealing with a chemical spill. It contaminated the water supply. Roughly 300,000 people in West Virginia have been without tap water. The rush for water was immediate. After that sold out, so did juice, soft drinks, anything liquid, leaving customers scrambling for ice. What are you going to do about showering or well, cleaning honey, your baby? You're going to melt this down. That's what you're gonna do, like you did back in the old days, put a little tub, put them in there, and just take a, you know, like a bird bath. 700 people in the Charleston area have called poison control centers. The smell was so strong that we had to actually cover our faces up. I think there should be a thorough investigation of what happened and why this incident happened at Freedom Industries. I'd say if they knew more about the chemical itself, that's probably what's got so many people scared to death now. Nobody knows that much about it. The water company people, you think they could have figured out what's safe, what's not safe, before they fired them intakes up and polluted every water line throughout the valley. Yeah, you're coming up on it. It's got a hole rusted through it. See, they've got all this containment boom in here. That's probably where it was breaking out of the wall. Do you think these people would have cared more and do more visual inspections to prevent something like this from ever happening? They knew the water company was just down the road. It'd probably take them months, but they'll cut all them tanks up and haul it to scrap, and make one big feel out of it. As long as it's sitting there, the people is going to remember it. And that's the main thing. They want it all to go away. We've had the daughter to the hospital. She had a severe rash. Her mm -hmm. neck started to swell, and it doubled in size. Is this your uh, your first trip to Charleston? I haven't been to Charleston before, but I used to come to West Virginia when I was a kid. Um, I, we had family here, my uncle. He passed away when I was 10. I haven't been back here since, but I remember loving it. He taught me how to shoot a bow and arrow and played in streams. It's kind of a novelty being from California. <laughs> you don't have a lot of water. I still can't believe you guys live so close to Freedom Industries. You mind if we go up there? Sure, we can go, if you like. Oh, there you go. There's the smell. Yeah, that, you smell that now, do you? Yeah. Whoa. This is a detergent for coal, the chemical that leaked out. But you know, this is really just a drop in the bucket because we live in Chemical Valley. You know, have you heard that term yet? What? Are you in the water? Oh, crap. Oh, I forgot. 
it seemed that within the chemical valley, Freedom Industries was a relatively small company. Their primary business was buying, selling, and mixing chemicals. They hadn't talked to any reporters since their last press conference the day after the spill. Our intent is to be totally... Oh, okay. Okay. Deza, are there no systems in place to, to alert you of a leak at your facility other than a smell? At, at this moment in time, I think that's all we have time for. So thanks for coming. Thanks for what, We have oh, more oh, questions. Oh. Hey, hey, hey. It was a PR disaster, and it had a pronounced effect on the people I spoke to in town. So if this was a whodunit mystery... There's no whodunit. Freedom Industries did it. They are the sole culprit. So if this happens again in the future, we would say that that other company was the sole culprit? So, well, certainly. Who are you going to blame? Uh, it's just unconscionable that Freedom Industry could not have known about the leak, did not report the leak, and did not know how much the leak had happened. It's unconscionable to me. My outrage and everybody else's outrage should be that. We test our water extensively and regularly. But remember, we're reacting to an event. So you're asking, is it not regulated that we test for this or other types of compounds? No. The odor became apparent in the finished water. The water company and state officials waited more than six hours before informing the public. But ultimately, they had little choice. The smell demanded an explanation. Regarding the freedom industry site, we will not be making any comments, uh, nor will we be permitting access to the site. It didn't require an engineer to see that the tanks and walls were falling apart. But why was an industrial facility even allowed to get this bad? Was the story of Freedom Industries just a distraction? We have enough regulations on the books. And what the administration ought to be doing is actually doing their jobs. Why wasn't this plant inspected since 1991? I am entirely confident that there are ample regulations already on the books to protect the health and safety of the American people. Somebody ought to be held accountable here. A lot has been made over, with DEP, you haven't been to the site since 92, or maybe you've only been two times in the 2000s. And <clears throat> right, wrong, or indifferent, simply visiting those sites would not have prevented this problem. The DEP, or Department of Environmental Protection, regulates all of the industry in the state. They're essentially the environmental policemen. Randy Huffman, he's in charge of it, and he plays a major role in this story. Well, let's say in the instance of freedom, you had gone and inspected the tanks. What would that have revealed? We, we would have probably walked the site, looked for the obvious evidence of material leaking from the tanks, visible holes in the secondary containment. But there were visible holes. I, 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 I uh, it, it's unfortunate, uh, you know, assigning, trying, uh, the blame is on freedom. The blame is on the company uh, for, for having tanks that were not up to any kind of standard. I mean, <laughs> I'm reluctant to say this on camera. I joked to somebody about this the other day. It takes cigarettes 30 or 40 years to kill you. I can't imagine that, uh, you know, a couple of days of MCHM, well, but that's, that's not even, I just say that in jest because it's not fair for me to say I'm not a, I'm not a health professional. Hey, this is Dr. Gupta from the health department. So there is very limited information on this chemical to begin with. We're seeing people are suffering on the ground um, every day. I don't have a lot to offer to them right now. They have faith in me, and that's the reason they're calling me. You sent me an email about somebody calling about their 97-year-old grandmother. Dr. Gupta runs the local health department. He also turns out to be the other major player in the story. For some reason, he was the only official who seemed concerned that this chemical might have negative health effects. I'm not keeping any registry at this point, and the reason for that is that we're not getting a lot of support from a lot of people, resistance from people who don't want to know what's going on. Obviously, the folks at state and federal level are so strongly convinced that there are not going to be no long-term impacts of this. I have not yet found the evidence on which they base their such a strong convictions upon.
spell your name for me and your correct title. Laura Jordan, L-A-U-R-A-J-O-R-D-A-N, External Affairs Manager for West Virginia American Water. Is the water safe? Yes, the water is safe to drink. I want to issue a challenge to all the experts and officials that are testing our water and telling us it's safe. Whatever you're telling us to do with the water, you do it first and I'll be happy to follow. It still smells like licorice. I just poured this this morning straight out of the tap. Even though the water still had an odor, Officials were saying it was safe for use. I want health for my daughter that's sick from there. This was thanks to a determination that had been made by the CDC, or Centers for Disease Control, who said that one part of MCHM per one million parts of water, or one ppm, was okay to drink. This is the equivalent of squeezing one drop of MCHM into a 10-gallon fish tank. But here's what's strange. Only a few days later, they issued a statement advising pregnant women to find an alternate drinking water source due to a limited availability of data. I'm not saying the water is safe. They're saying the water is safe. The water company is saying the water is safe. The CDC is saying water is safe. When people shower or use the water other ways, they're having self-reported associations with rashes, eye irritations, asthma attacks, we should be more forthright in saying, we cannot tell you if this is or this is not related to the chemical. But we're sure gonna find out. With its 15 million customers, American Water is the biggest private water company in the United States. And their Charleston operation services the largest area on the East Coast more than 2,500 square miles. And water here was some of the most expensive in the country. But looking around, neither of these facts made any sense because water was everywhere. Why were people paying so much money to pump water halfway across the state from a single source? I've been drinking it since they lifted the do not use, but nobody else in the household will. We're supposed to trust these people to provide us with clean, safe drinking water. Then we got a creek right here that just had 108,000 gallons of slurry go down. I'm all for coal. I'm 100% for coal, 100% against Obama. I guess in a lot of ways, I'm just fed up with things that's happening around here, but I can't go nowhere because I don't know how to do anything other than mine coal. You should never have a problem. Then they put mines up here, mines up here and stuff and all that sludge and whatever. They do, even into the aquifer, it's dripping. And then for years, they said, oh, it smells funny, but it's okay to drink it. Half the people in this trailer park died from cancer. That's why they changed and the well all no these good. to um, city, city water. water. And next thing you know, what we're getting, we're getting contaminated yeah. freaking water. rust and stuff out of old mines. I guess that water comes out at mines. Even your clothes will look like that. This is what come out of the spigot. I guess the water started back with the coal mines, which was about a mile down the road here, which my grandfather worked in. And my dad worked in it, and I worked in it. The mines has done good up until just recently. You start looking back at some of the things that's happened to you or to other people, and the sickness that's going on. And when I wake up in the morning, I think I'm still living. I think it's a great day. Besides coal, the other big industry here is chemical. And it was still unclear if the industry at large had played a role in this crisis. You guys want some water? Chemical Valley is about a 25-mile stretch of the Kanawha River. 
that has tons of chemical manufacturing facilities on it. For, for your all's knowledge, people see cameras and they think it kind of like shit, job security. So some people are friendly and welcoming of it, but a lot of people aren't because it gets bad publicity. The plant's gonna shut down and they're not gonna be able to feed their kids. That's where the coal-fired power plant is that they have for that facility. This is where they dump all the toxic stuff. And actually for a long time, they didn't know what Union Carbide dumped. And I know this because of when I worked there. When I was 16 years old, there was an explosion at the methamyl larvin unit in Institute. I tried to like tape up the windows and the doors of my house like they, they told us to do in school and by that time I was already exposed. So that incident kind of just changed my life. Okay. We are learning new information about the second substance found in the West Virginia chemical spill, the chemical PPH. I know that many of you here would like an update on the new material that was uh, found uh, yesterday. Part of our team here from DEP. Sure. Governor, thank you. Should the DEP have known about this sooner, or should someone else from the government have known about this sooner? On, on the day of the spill, when we asked the question, what was in, what's in the tank, the question that we asked should have revealed this as well. By this, Randy means that what actually spilled was a mixture of chemicals, and 5.6% of it was this other chemical called PPH. Imagine that this beverage is what spilled, and they didn't find the lemon juice. Both state and federal regulators were doing testing. How had this gone undetected? What did the latest test results say this afternoon? Mike might be able to an I, answer I, the I, test results. I, I just haven't seen the most recent test results. So did Freedom Industries have any records about PPH? Well, they had their end dog, the, the, what they were shipping in and shipping out, but it was pretty, pretty rough. They also had three tanks of this material, and they were shifting it between tanks. Uh, oh. Why did the DEP allow them to operate like this? Black Hole Ether is the district the product we get to experience with. The PHH, PPH, uh, is, even, is even less of a concern than the MCHM is. So was your background in environmental science or anything like that? I came out of, I came out of college with a mining engineering degree. There were no jobs in the mining industry at the time. This was in the mid-80s. Uh, I came to work for uh, what was the Department of Energy at the time in state government as a last resort. We could regulate CO2 out of existence in this country, and it's not going to have any measurable impact globally. Looking through the archives, Randy Huffman, he had the kind of report card that you'd hide from your parents loosening regulations, turning a blind eye to thousands of miles of dirty streams, granting pollution waivers. The DEP had even gone so far as to sue their federal counterpart, the Environmental Protection Agency, when the federal agency tried to enforce the Clean Water Act. This is a 100% victory. We won, said Randy Huffman. For a while, it was reported that the DEP simply didn't review the wastewater pollution reports of companies around the state these added up to over 25,000 violations of the Clean Water Act. For whatever reason, we weren't getting it done, Huffman said. It was a glitch, and they got off track with it. 25,000. I believe in the production of coal, its value to our country, and I will continue to do everything that I can to fight the EPA and its misguided attempts to cripple this industry. After reviewing some of the past state-of-the-state state addresses given by the governor, it seemed that fighting environmental regulation, well, that was something that brought Democrats and Republicans together. And this is how the state's Democratic U.S. Senator won his seat. I'm Joe Manchin. I sued EPA, and I'll take dead aim at the cap-and-trade bill, because it's bad for West Virginia. It seemed that the EPA's proposed emissions program was also bad for his coal business, a business that had earned him millions. Now at that time, he was the state's governor. And here's what Joe Manchin did right at the beginning of his term. The first official new sign of West Virginia's progress 
started going up today, which shows the true beauty of West Virginia. It's a little hard to read, but he actually changed the slogan of the state to open for business. So I asked a retired employee from the DEP if this translated into weaker enforcement. Yes, Joe Manchin, in my opinion, did initiate a more lax uh, environmental enforcement atmosphere while he was in office, and even, it seems, even until today. Joe Manchin had appointed Randy Huffman nearly 10 years ago, and it seemed he was still doing the exact job that he'd been hired to do. They tell us, oh, uh, it's the flu. It's not the water at all. It's something else. And they send us home like this, and then, you know, we go home and sit there and cry. And it's wrong how they're doing us. It's not the hospital's job to make sure they ask questions every time somebody comes to the rest. They're too busy for that. The job's not surveillance. Need a program that will actually be an, encourage people to come in, describe their symptoms. That needs to be followed over several years. That's the way you prove connections, the chemical and other things. How soon do we need to start this in order to... Two weeks ago. I mean, it should have been done. You know, I'm not interested in writing tickets or assessing fines. I don't need to collect money from people just because. Give the benefit of the doubt to organizations and assume that people aren't out there trying to break the law, but they would like to comply, and give them a shot at it. Do you think, though, that, like, that ideology lets companies like Freedom Through the Cracks? No, I don't. Maybe you can correct this. Uh, in the five years before 2008, something like 25,000 violations of the Clean Water Act occurred, but no fines were ever issued. Uh, yeah, 35,000 is not that many. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that. This is a whole lot more complicated uh, than something you, you can just put in a sound bite and say, well, here's 35,000 violations for which there were never, never was a penalty. Nearly three weeks had gone by, and yet for some reason, the water still had a smell. So people didn't trust it. And they also didn't trust the state or federal officials who were saying that the water was safe to drink. It's three weeks, we, we haven't been told anything. Try to force feed us underneath the tape. Is this water safe for him? Purging is not working. American water didn't even bother to show up. There was only one official there, to take all of the heat. What kind of inspection? How often do you do it? Do you do it every month, every year, once a week? It was hard to tell if Randy Huffman was playing dumb or he really didn't know anything. I'm not aware of any full spectrum uh, testing that's been done. I wouldn't make any judgments on that at all. No evidence that we've seen, and I'm just not aware of it. I'm sure it'll reveal something that we didn't know. I apologize, but I'm not familiar with the protocols at all that the water company used to, to do their sampling. Why don't you become... I have a question. Uh, Freedom's been ordered to uh, remove the tanks. No, there will not be another tank farm operating on that site. Nobody else is going to be there. Right. We need to understand the basics of this. We are the first human beings this chemical has ever been experimented on. Tested on rats and some of the other lab animals. I vehemently disagree with any, any official anywhere who's saying, well, this is flu or this is something else, because it's not. Don't let anyone around you convince you that you don't see and you aren't experiencing what you're experiencing. Dr. Gupta has really stepped up, and I have yet in 22 years of work seen a health official do that. So thank you. We're working closely with the legislature on some specific uh, rules. Here's the thing. Regulation without enforcement is pointless. It was brutal. It was the worst place. It was the. It might have been the worst, the worst uh, experience that I've had in this job. The police escorted me to my truck because they were concerned <laughs> for my safety. I wasn't, but they they were. They just. I think they just wanted something to do. But while Randy and his agency may be responsible for a lot of problems in the state, as it turns out, the inspection of above ground storage tanks wasn't one of them. I could send inspectors to that site every day. I'm not going to know that that hole is getting ready to rust the rest of the way through and leak the material. 
What we need to prevent this problem is something that we don't have. Some kind of policy decision by Congress or by our state legislatures at some point was made. One thing was for sure. The politicians didn't want any of this blame coming back to them. I've heard there's a lot of political corruption and that lobbyists wield a lot of influence here. That would be more so in Washington than here. The idea of regulation as in ensuring the safety of storage tanks, we always assumed that that was in place. That's the type of regulation everyone wants. But when it came to making this law, Chris also had a little extra motivation. I mean, I'd been drinking all day. I'd just gotten out of the shower right before our date. Mm -hmm. I thought about the baby and what was going to happen. And he used to take 45 minutes. I used to get clean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel comfortable with my biggest organ being exposed to something that they know nothing about. And I don't feel comfortable with my daughters or my husband's. Across the state, there was a contest to determine the best drinking water in the world. I wanted to see how this water that had been declared safe for use stacked up against the competition. This is in Charleston water. You tell me. It's really incredible. I mean, it, it's like a big bottle of licorice. On odor, I would score it as low as I could. The, the people who test this say it's acceptable to drink. That's that right? what they say. Let me smell that again. Yeah. Because that's atrocious. Oh. I would love to give you our Beverly Hills 908 show water, the first sommelier crafted water in the world. Is this crafted by you? Yes. I, I tried to get it entered here, but they didn't accept it. Too bad. The first, oh. My grandmother always said, and she survived two world wars, mm -hmm. when, you, when water has an odor, don't drink it. This has. I will tell you, this is the best trade I've ever made. <laughs> yeah, I think so too, yeah. <laughs> I think so too. And I will trade this with a trash can. <laughs> Everyone's upset about their water bill. You know that, right? I know they are. Can you at least give us a break? You can smell MCHM in water below the protective health limit. As a water company, Are you sleeping? We, I'm sleeping great. Give the people in this valley some confidence. We have to follow what's given to us as health-based guidance. It is a fear-based issue because people can smell it. I'm, I'm understanding that not one of you up here are willing to say unequivocally it's safe, and I would assume that, that you'd have to have zero parts per billion, trillion, no nothing. We monitor for 100 contaminants at various times throughout the year. And if anyone thinks that every water treatment system has absolutely zero of all of these chemicals or compounds, they're mistaken. There are limits set. Water utilities simply don't have the information on how to remove 50,000 chemicals from the water. Yeah. So the Environmental Protection Agency, I believe, sets those standards. There was little information available. That's just surprising to me, which is why we got involved. I'm not here to convince you the water is safe. I'm here to figure out if it is. Dr. Andy Welton had just arrived with a team of students. He's an independent scientist and a water protection strategist who used to work for the military. There's simply not a lot of data associated with what chemicals are in waterways and water sources. In fact, the EPA only requires water companies to test for 76 chemicals. And since MCHM wasn't on this list, it was legal for it to be in the water. But MCHM has an extremely rare quality. You can smell it in the parts per billion. It's like putting one drop of MCHM into a 10,000 gallon fish tank. In the drinking water industry, we're looking for that one device that can tell us everything. Because it doesn't exist, we have to rely on multiple devices to tell us a little bit of information about the water that we're looking at. But aren't there more than 80,000 chemicals used in commerce? Right, and because they... So you're saying there's no way to test for them? There is no tricorder. To, to determine which of the 80,000 chemicals is present. Because there was an odor, that was exactly how it was detected. Mm -hmm. So imagine, without the smell, the chemical would have gone unnoticed. People would have drank MCHM without knowing. Just insist on leaving your complaint and your intent not to pay. And the CDC would never have had to determine that one part per million was safe. A lot of things just didn't make sense. So how did the CDC come up with its screening levels? We all have the same question. 
Is my water really safe? I value and trust the opinions of the CDC and the EPA. Thank you very much, Governor. Is your water safe? What I can say is that you can use your water however you like. We had expected them to come in and, and ease people's fears. Instead, they, they just threw a little gasoline on the fire. There are no studies on humans for this substance. After the water use ban has been lifted, if we're still smelling the water in the way we are, there's some amount of chemical somewhere. Uh, CDC has set a screening level. Doesn't mean there is potentially zero in there. You know, they gave us a one part per million, and then they came to town and wouldn't say that, that it was safe to drink. You know, the Centers for Disease Control, everybody relies on. And at that point, you're, everybody is sort of dumbfounded. So for some reason, the most important health agency in the entire world was no longer willing to use the word safe. In refusing to declare the water safe, I think we're setting ourselves up in the future for something that we may not be proud of. This is an independent project. We're pleased to have you and we appreciate your help, Dr. Welton. As far as the testing phase, we go out tomorrow. Dr. Welton went from working on his own dime to working for the governor. It was now his job to do what the CDC could not. Eastman Chemical. They make about $9 billion every year. They're the original creator of MCHM, which means they're required to create a safety data sheet that tells you all these symptoms and effects. It's the only information that's available to the public and to emergency responders. The people in my world, that's what we rely on. We go out on a truck wreck or something and there's a tank leaking, we got to look at the data sheet. That's all we have. But if you look at the data sheet for MCHM, nearly every field reads no data available, including most important symptoms and effects. However, there was one useful piece of information. The average amount of MCHM it takes to kill a rat. Anytime you talk about what levels are safe for people to expose to, that's a big deal. But how the CDC determined what amount was acceptable is kind of shocking. Without knowing if MCHM causes cancer or reproductive harm, the CDC decided what amount was safe from this piece of information, how much Eastman Chemical says it takes to kill a rat. This would explain why the CDC told pregnant women not to drink the water. It seemed that they didn't know what the effects might be. What we don't know of this chemical is what is its metabolism, its excretion, what is its cancer potential, anything else. I think it's very important that everybody that needs to know this information gets to know this information in an openly transparent manner. These are studies that are done in secrecy. They are not available to the public or the regulators to review. Companies have had trade secrets for as long as they've been in business so that the competition wouldn't have access to their information. And you don't have to look far to find an example. According to the safety data sheet of PPH, the second chemical in the spill, its identity was withheld as a trade secret. But this is actually the norm. There's a government accountability report that revealed 95% of new chemicals contain some information claimed as confidential. 95%. But MCHM was no longer confidential because Eastman Chemical had released the studies. At least one thing stood out. There was a note from a lead researcher. It said that their first study of MCHM had bad rats, so the results were of limited value. And the rats had exhibited something called hematuria. Turns out, the rats were peeing blood. Was it normal to blame undesirable results on the rats? If you say it's bad rats, that's cool. That's understood. But then you cannot change your study methodology. Look at the first and second oral toxicity study. Well, they seem to have changed everything, if you see. Wait, what do you mean? The number of rats have changed. The duration of the study has changed. The people doing the study has scaled down to one person. So you're a lawyer. Who are you suing? Everybody. 
the clinical finding in the lab notes that was never put in any report was not that there was just hematuria, but that in some of the rats, the blood was actually green that was in the urine. Where was this study? Because I didn't see it. Well, you couldn't find that by looking at the study. You'd have to sue Eastman and get into the discovery process and then get their lab notes. Well, you want to go to the first spot? Yeah, let's go. Hold on to your everything here. There you go. People joke with me all the time. They know that I fish, and, and they'll say, oh, you know, if you catch any, you know, any three-eyed fish out there, oh, you catch them to form them once in a while, but fish are just like people. Every time I'm in this area, there's only that, like, sweet smell. Can you smell it? Yeah. I forget what they make down there. But they're permitted to, like, dump a certain amount here, right? That's how it works. Yeah, they're permitted to dump a certain amount of certain things. I, you know, I don't know. Did you go out and test the water? No, it, they, they test their outfalls. They, they test what's in their outfalls, and then uh, they report that to us once a quarter. So you basically just trust them? I, that's a good question. How do I know that they're, if, they're, if they're telling the truth? We don't, we've never, never had that kind of problem, because they, they typically will contract that out to a third party to come in and, and do the sampling and then, and then prepare the report. How do you know if there's a violation? Yeah, we, we, uh, we'll look at their reports. Later that night, I went to the EPA's website to see how many facilities his agency had actually inspected. Only 11, less than any other state. But while I was here, I saw something that surprised me. There were huge numbers of violations in every state. The national average for facilities dumping more than they're supposed to was 38%. West Virginia was actually below the national average. The Clean Water Act requires a fine of not less than $2,500, nor more than $25,000 per day of violation. So how much are companies actually being fined in total? Here's the average total fine in West Virginia. California was the highest. But in many states, the total fine wasn't even above the required daily minimum of $2,500. In Illinois, the fine is less than a parking ticket. It made sense why weak enforcement might be happening in West Virginia, but I couldn't understand why it seemed to be happening everywhere else. It's not a giant, but it's a fish. <laughs> It was the last day of the legislative calendar, and they were holding a vote on what was now colloquially known as the tank bill. If it passed, it would be the strongest piece of environmental legislation the state had seen in a generation. Environmental pollution is really not a problem when it doesn't affect you, but what happens if it does? This sounds like a real FIMBY issue. What's FIMBY? It's in my backyard. Concerned citizens come into the Capitol to voice their opinion on the water situation in Charleston. Well, I was told I, I wasn't allowed to sit on the floor, so I'm going to sit up in the gallery with the people. 59 days since our water was poisoned. This is the exclamation point on the end of our success in dealing with the water crisis this year. The question now is on passage of the bill. All those in favor will vote green. All those opposed will vote red. The clerk will prepare the machine. Near the stroke of midnight, the tank bill passed unanimously. Incredibly, West Virginia had just become the first state to enact this type of a law. It was down to the wire, but the process isn't done. It is for this legislative session, but there's next year as well. It, it now goes from words to actual work that, that my department has to do. So there are a lot of tanks out there, and there's a lot of stuff in this bill that has to be done. You counted the tanks yet? No. Before, I have questions. But today, based on the evidence, the information, the chemical levels of people's homes, the water is safe to drink. 
The water no longer had a smell, and Dr. Welton made his announcement to an empty room. It was fall of 2014, and the DEP had finished inspecting storage tanks across the state. They found 1,100 that were in such bad shape, they had to be decommissioned. 1,100. Was it this bad around the country? Maybe unregulated chemicals had been spilling with regularity, chemicals that you couldn't smell. And if that's the case, then Freedom Industries was just horribly unlucky. Four former Freedom officers have been indicted by a federal grand jury. It's alleged the defendants violated the Federal Clean Water Act. According to the FBI, Southern lied about his role with the company prior to being named president. He now faces 30 years in prison. Dr. Gupta. Hey, how are you? <laughs> it had been a full year since the crisis. Well. Congratulations on your new role. Well, thank you very much. Dr. Gupta was now in charge of health for the entire state. Now, does this mean you're part of state government? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. What's that like? <laughs> Things seemed good, almost better than good. That is, until I sat him down for his interview, something was off. Of course, we've had since multiple developments, positive developments, and I think we've been able to strengthen a number of things across in the state. Uh, we're working to further strengthen over the next year or two um, many more things that we have been even over and above and top of prior uh, what we've done before. <clears throat> Perhaps he couldn't speak freely because there was a government handler in the room. Some folks are just a little concerned, you know. And, uh, like, man, it's just gotten burned a little bit before with the, I think he did something with the cold the documentary. And I had to convince my handlers. Uh, I'm very respectful, but I'm, uh, you know, I'll do the right thing at the end of the day. They would know it. Right, right. You know completely under the control of, of the there you four go. powers that be. There you go. All right. Andy, I'm sorry. I, what exactly are you trying to say about MCHM? Uh, I didn't get the same data, same result as Eastman. The level that was toxic was about twice concentrated. Does that mean that MCHM is twice as toxic as what Eastman reported? Yes. Yes. Why would somebody like us be discovering that the toxicity data that's used for a chemical that's in commerce be wrong. So the MSDS information... Be wrong. And not just slightly wrong. Well, that throws the whole system into question. Right. The advice I give to responders nowadays is don't trust anybody. If the science was this wrong with one chemical, science that's usually confidential, what were the odds that companies were fabricating safety data on a far larger scale? And how are they getting away with it? The water doesn't smell like licorice anymore. You know, and people have resumed their normal lives. Lobbyists have had a year to really plot and plan. They were very, very quiet last year, and that was strategic. Perhaps this meant there was an opportunity to see who really controls chemical policies and the safety of water. So what's up with the tank bill? So a year goes by now, people are, are saying, well, maybe we, uh, maybe we should go back and revisit. Uh, it basically undoes all that was done last year, and it makes any kind of a, a regulatory framework for tanks irrelevant and meaningless. Well, who are the groups then that are behind this? Oh, no one puts their name on the bill. Uh, you can almost figure it out when you look at the legislation and see who benefits most from it. And that tells you a lot. The bill specifically said just because you're oil and gas related means you're exempt. There was no other scientific reason behind it. Do you think that what happened last year changed you at all? Yeah, I think so. It changed uh, uh, not just me, maybe it was just me, maybe my perspective is what's changed, but it got some people at the table, citizen activists. Their idea is not to change, you know, this philosophical change in the, in the world, but it's about dealing with practical issues, such as, you know, keeping your water clean. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 115, I'll see you up there. You guys just missed the governor walking out. Do you mind taking a camera with you? Then you just hit this on the side. And it videos. 
There had been a massive train derailment. At least 18 tankers had spilled oil into the river. It seemed like a bad time to try to undo last year's bill. So my understanding is that there's an effort to remove at least 99% of all the tanks from needing to be inspected. There's such a huge influx of so many lobbyist groups buying individual indiv members. Uh, until I learn more about it, I, I can't speak to what the bill completely will do, but it doesn't look good. The lobbyists hovered around the center of the Capitol. Are you guys oil and gas, or are you something else? I'm cities. You guys filming us right now? Hi. You can cut it, please. Sure, thank, thank you. Well, I uh, represent a, a series of businesses, oil and gas, manufacturing, uh -huh. just larger employers. So were you involved in drafting the legislation at all? No. Who would that be? That's a great question. Rebecca is the president of the manufacturer. She would be a good uh, contact point for you. And I, don't, I have not seen her here today. Even the Democratic senator who created the original tank bill was now supporting the gutting of it. I read through the piece of legislation that it, there's no third party inspection, there's no anything. You assume that everybody are telling the truth, but every once in a while the IRS will audit you. If I cheat on my taxes, 300,000 people don't get poisoned. So this was a bill that was introduced by industry folks. Speaking of industry folks, what did Rebecca Randolph send you? Oh, I don't know, you can have it. One of the 100 years of the West Virginia manufacturers. Oh, Swiss chocolates. Oh, that's nice. Are they the most powerful of all the lobbies? Probably the Coal Association also has a lot to say. Any way you need to contact her, it's, uh, it's right here. Maybe I'll keep this one. The derailment had forced American Water to shut down one of its treatment plants. They had refused all of my interview requests, so it was a rare opportunity to find out their stance on these changes. I think that any attempts right now to try to weaken water protections, especially with events like this and, and last year's event being so fresh in people's mind, I can't imagine uh, anyone being on board with that. The Manufacturers Association is a coalition of businesses who lobby for their shared interests. It includes chemical companies like DuPont, Dow, and Bayer. But there was one name on this list I didn't expect. It seemed that the water company was putting their bottom line before the safety of their only product. You have a new job, you have 900 yeah. people working yeah. for you, and yeah. the stakes are really high, so you're in a very difficult political environment, but why not try and protect yeah. this regulation? There's plenty of folks out there that can do that. Um, I cannot afford to do it. Here's my responsibility and my role, and I intend to fully do that. It's very important that we keep scientific evidence in front and center of every policy making and not go in reverse, because that's exactly what some of the times the other side is trying to do. Bad guys aren't your traditional bad guys here. And traditional good guys aren't the good guys. So that's one of the things that I will tell you. We've got a lab just had to shut down because they had a lab person uh, admit to fabricating results, fabricating it, this, the same analytical data that you're talking about that they're supposed to self-report. They were doing tests for a lot of coal companies and other folks. I don't know, I don't know who the ones were for that they actually fabricated. I, I don't know the specifics on that. But the bottom line doesn't matter. Is it, is it brings in the questions into question the integrity of the whole operation. Uh, so you're going to run for governor in two years? Mm, I'm going to run from the Capitol, not for the Capitol. I was trying to find Rebecca Randolph, obviously, today. She wasn't in. I, do you think she'll be in tomorrow? There's a bill up at 2 o'clock. Like a stakeholders meeting? Yeah, I know she'll be here for that. So right behind me in the corner over there, a stakeholders meeting is going on. I don't know who all's involved in this, but we've been told that Rebecca uh, the Manufacturers Association is there along with uh, anyone who's considered a stakeholder in the state. I'm just gonna go in. So it's similar to the language on page 18, but a little bit different. I couldn't believe it. Every major lobbying group was in that room 
You're riding the tank belt in front of me. I mean, I hear everyone on, on how they're already regulated, and maybe that's good enough. What else could have been done to minimize the risk of the freedom thing? And, and that's, you know, yeah. to me, it goes back to certification and inspection process. Well, what's wrong? I mean, where do you guys see the issue with, with what we're already covered up? Had that been going on for some period of time, um, years, that leak would have never happened. Randy seemed to be putting up a pretty good fight. Um, one classification, which still presents a problem for a lot of other folks, because that is so... The more hazardous or dangerous it is, then it needs to be included in level one. We don't think that's workable for us. We're already covered under adequate stringent regulations. That, that's not going to work, guys. I'm, I'm telling you, we'll go back to a ground war for exemption to coal mining operations and individuals. I think we've done all we, the damage we can do today. There you have it. That's how a law is weakened beyond recognition. But where had these changes come from in the first place? Rebecca? Hi, Colin Hoback. I've been trying to get a hold of you. Were you um, relevant in terms of like crafting the bill itself? Like, did you... uh, I mean, we, we had some input. Like, candidly, what I'm going to tell you on camera I mean, is that our folks will be the first ones to get in line to do what's necessary when considering protection of the resource that we're trying to protect. Are you going to work to change the bill from its current form to make it so it covers more of the tanks that are out there? Because like right now, it just literally undoes last year. I don't, I mean, we'll have to agree to disagree on that. <laughs> Confusion sometimes, but we know who has the strength and who has the power. In the name of the Savior, I serve Christ Jesus. Amen. It was once again the last day of session, and they were about to vote on changing the tank bill. The bill had been undone with little fanfare, and other Freedom Industries was primed to happen again. Senator Hall, uh, yes. were you the uh, lead sponsor on SB 423? Yes, I was. Did you, uh, did you, did you write the bill, or? Uh... No, I didn't write it. I mean, attorneys wrote it. So who, whose attorneys wrote it? Well, shoot. I mean, it was done. Uh, it, it uh, I can't even tell you. I mean, it. Their manufacturers associated. I don't know. I don't know who did it. But surely someone came to you with the bill, right? And they said, would you, would you be the lead sponsor on this? People from the manufacturers association. <laughs> What's your interest in knowing who gave me the bill? Well, I've just been following the water crisis from the beginning. Okay. And so because the bill... Well, let me tell uh, you what I told people. Somebody else got a speeding ticket and everybody else got a fine. That's the way I view it. That's it. I mean, you know, it, 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 it just gave an opportunity for people to come in and just cause all sorts of regulatory problems for us. So I'm happy for seven years. I'm glad my name is on the top. It's not a bad bill. No, it's a good bill. The guy didn't even know the number of his own bill. It's 423, not 473. Maybe it's because he didn't write the bill. It was the Manufacturers Association. Maybe he should be fist bumping them. Industry wasn't just undermining laws that protect water. They were literally writing them. Just how far did this kind of control reach? Did you see what hit the news the other day, right? The National Toxicology Program was requested to conduct replica testing of yeast and chemical data. Now have classified this as a reproductive toxin. Many people weren't drinking the water, but they were all bathing in it. Well, I mean, I know I was bathing in it for those two and a half months. You were bathing in it for two and a half months? Oh, wow. Did you look at the stuff that the National Toxicology Program released? Um, I didn't. Well, one thing they ended up saying about MCHM is that it could cause reproductive harm. His muscle development was a little off, but... The symptoms associated with that are developmental. Yeah, that's it. That's crazy, actually. That's weird. But he's fine now, but he was about six months behind in muscle development for a while. So... You no, know, we were worried, and we, of course, had that in the back of our mind that... 
there was no medical monitoring, so there was no doctor visits that happened every single year to check in or anything like that to show, you know, uh, I guess a conclusion. So we had our study peer reviewed and we sent the CDC a copy of the report. The CDC refused to comment on it. On your data, the study proving MCHM was twice as toxic? That's right. National Toxicology Program said that the impacts are psychological. There's no data to support either of those statements, which means that there's organizations making stuff up. So the type of phenomena that you think happen in corporations may also be happening in government. But why would the CDC go out of their way to hide the truth about MCHM? It didn't make sense. January of 2016, it's when the international spotlight turned towards a lead contamination in the drinking water of Flint, Michigan. It used to be cars were made in Flint and you couldn't drink the water in Mexico. Now, the cars are made in Mexico and you can't drink the water in Flint. It makes you feel bad as a parent to know that you've been poisoning your child all this time. Why are you worried? Because. Can you tell them why? I think it's not, it's not gonna be fixed. We're gonna have problems with kids in special education services, cognition, behavior problems, focusing. It was a shot in the dark, but maybe this contamination held the key to opening up this story. And a lot of people in Flint have lead pipe like this going from the water main that runs down the street into their home. Scientists from Virginia Tech came up to test the water in Flint. The corrosive water actually ate up every metallic pipe in the system. Government officials, it turns out, did know about the lead. We are fully cooperating with investigations and will hold those individuals accountable. Unlike MCHM, lead doesn't have an odor. This had enabled officials to cover this up for over two years. But this is a case where there's a failure, in particular, in the Department of Environmental Quality. But I had a hard time believing that officials would knowingly poison 8,000 kids just to save a few bucks on water. The parts per billion in our house was over 13,000. 13,000. I've never seen a level that high. And the state removed her house from the sampling protocol. Like, where are the red flags that were going off in people's brains? Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha is one of the two main people that brought this contamination to light. She looked at the blood results of more than 1,700 children from Flint. So we were attacked. So the state said that I was causing near hysteria, that their numbers were not consistent with our numbers. When the state tells you you're, you're wrong, it's hard not to second guess yourself. They have a team of 50 epidemiologists. You're supposed to sample from homes that have lead plumbing. They sampled from homes that didn't have lead plumbing. So there was a lot of kind of manipulations of how um, the water lead levels were being done. So it continued the kind of almost two years of denial. Denial was a problem. I was reminded of the CDC refusing Dr. Welton's results. Why were these agencies covering up the facts? What's strange is that it didn't even seem like the politicians were in on it. Here's the governor of Michigan testifying before Congress. If we'd go back to the experts over and over again, we were told the water was safe. That was wrong. It wasn't just one department. As it continued on, we got information not only from the DEQ, but the Department of Health and Human Services that they didn't see elevated levels in blood. These departments that he's describing, they're analogs to the ones that Randy Huffman and Dr. Gupta run. Here's my briefing from the night before, and it's information from both those departments dismissing people. I get so mad that I never should have believed them. So we had cases where it took outside experts. That's tragic. So this is scary. You've got uh, reproductive toxins, um, cancer hazards. Well, at least they're labeled. Yeah, yeah. DC prepared me and my team for Flint. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mark Edwards, outside expert in Flint, number two, 
And it turns out this wasn't even the first time he'd gone toe to toe with federal agencies over lead and drinking water. I had fought a 12 year battle in Washington DC exposing government science agency corruption, the Centers for Disease Control, the US EPA, the environmental policemen we pay to protect us were actually the environmental criminals. I mean, I, I no longer trust the CDC, why? Because the upper uh, levels of CDC is proving themselves untrustworthy too. The amount of harm in Washington, D.C. is 30 times worse than what happened in Flint, Michigan. See, they poisoned thousands of children, covered it up for about seven years. I had to betray some of my best friends, people I went to graduate school with, who were working with the EPA and creating fabricated reports. That who is creating that culture? Is it lobbyists? Is it the politicians who appoint them? Well. How could the Catholic Church do what it did, make it in your interest to engage in unethical behavior to cover up problems, and if you can get away with it, you will do that. Ultimately, there was a congressional hearing where they were chastised publicly, but no one was ever held accountable. It seemed history was repeating itself. Here's the head of the EPA at the congressional hearing about Flint. Has anybody been fired? That's a no, question. No, sir. Has anybody been dismissed? No, sir. EPA covered this up every step of the way. They will protect their reputation above all else. Oversight was our responsibility. We took that seriously and we conducted it. Does that mean I don't have regrets? One heroic employee there, he wrote a memo that said EPA should exert emergency powers. But in response, he was told that they weren't sure Flint was the kind of community they wanted to go out on a limb for. And so this EPA official was ignored over and over again. He was so fed up that after 27 years of working for the EPA, he had this to say. People trying to do the right thing are constantly being subjected to intense scrutiny as if we were doing something wrong. It's all of this don't find anything bad crap at EPA. That's the reason I desperately want to leave. EPA is a cesspool. This would explain why, in the months after Flint, when other communities tested their water systems, it turned out that Flint was just the tip of the iceberg. Pittsburghers are likely drinking water laced with toxic lead. Chicago parks shut off hundreds of drinking fountains. The water in Garfield, Texas. 10% of Portland homes. All drinking fountains at Ohio's most important and historic building. According to an investigation conducted by Reuters, Nearly 3,000 areas had lead poisoning rates far higher than in Flint. And then you ask the question, well, if they're doing that for lead and water, uh, what else are they hiding? How can we trust any of the science that's coming out of the EPA if this is the culture there? That's the reality, you cannot. It seemed that the EPA and CDC were too busy protecting their own reputations to be trusted. If Dr. Edwards was right, it's what I'd been missing. The fact is, most whistleblowers regret it. I was at the top of the game at EPA. My case, the EPA funded the University of Georgia to publish 20 years of fake data to counteract research I published at UGA documenting adverse health effects. How are you sure the data was being falsified, made up. The scientists admitting under oath that the data were faked and that they believed people were getting sick. In one case, a federal judge ruled the data were fabricated. The CDC is doing exactly the same thing that EPA is doing. The most astounding part of that is that even when the CDC and EPA admit their data are fake when they're caught, they still will not remove it from the scientific literature political appointees go through the revolving door between government and industry. Uh, they're washing each other's hands. Who runs independent tests outside of these agencies to ensure that drinking water is safe? That's the scary thing. Almost no one. There are other chemicals going to the water that are not being tested, not being reported. And there is a method for figuring out what those chemicals are. It's wicked expensive to do chemical testing. If you're looking to find something, you need to know what you're looking for. And that's a huge undertaking.
The plan was to test near major industrial sites in the river. If we found any chemicals at a high concentration, we would test for that same chemical in Taft's downstream. It was impossible to test for everything, so we picked chemicals that were the most likely suspects. Santa plant. Wastewater was right there. Yes. So have you been drinking the water? <laughs> I haven't since the whole thing started. You know, you have one bout with a rare cancer and you're real careful after that. I have a son-in-law who works for DuPont. Yeah, we're right right down from it now. Yeah, I'm real curious what they're putting in the water. I am too. I am too. What's that, Rick? Does the boat come towards us? You can throw these up on the way. All right, let's get out of here. Two months later, the scientists that I've been working with at USGS, or United States Geological Survey, sent me an email with the results. His response was surprising. There was no smoking gun. They found very little of the chemicals that they expected to be in the river. And we had done our testing near what should have been the release points. Either we had done something wrong, or they really weren't releasing all that much into the river. However, there was something that I didn't understand. In the lab report, there were all of these unidentified tiny little peaks. What was the big thing that you uncovered? People in towns and cities across America they were getting sick that live next to where land application of sewage sludge was occurring. It's the material that settles out at sewage treatment plants, mostly human feces, mixed with industrial waste, and it's free fertilizer. Some of it's sold at Home Depot and other outlets. Every chemical that could possibly cause harm to human health is there. So I went about to document these illnesses and deaths and found out that they were linked to an EPA policy. In the early 70s, we passed the Clean Water Act. Uh, that made it very expensive for uh, industry to pollute our rivers and lakes. So once their lobbyists got involved uh, and they got in bed with EPA and vice versa, what they wanted was there's no Clean Soil Act. Let's just dump all this on land, not regulate it, and make it free for us. That's what happened in 1993. That was the first Clinton administration. The agency was reorganized, the science was, so it became very political at that point. So industry is basically flushing chemicals down the drain. Now they don't have to build a pipe to the river and pay for it. They flush it down the toilet. That would explain why, when I tested the river, it, it was cleaner than I expected. Yeah, it's now going everywhere we live, work, and play. School playgrounds, uh, parks, golf courses, farms, forest. It rains, so it runs off into creeks and streams, goes into the rivers and lakes. It, I, I have to admit, it sounds a little far-fetched to me. Well, you see what happened in Flint. The, the mere fact that scientists cannot publish data that shows what the government's doing and what universities are doing, that explains all this. How old are the people who died? Uh, from small children uh, to elderly people. Looking back at the data from the river, it now made sense. All of these little peaks, they represented chemicals. Instead of there being huge amounts of just a few chemicals, there were small amounts of hundreds, if not thousands. And they couldn't be identified because we didn't know what to look for. Very little research was being done in this field. However, there were a number of studies that had looked for low levels of drugs appearing in rivers, drugs that people consume 
and then flush down the drain. Antidepressants, steroids, antibiotics, even meth. Every drug researchers had looked for was in the river, in the parts per billion range. And when they tested fertilizer made from sewage sludge, in many cases, the drugs were there too, but at exponentially higher levels. This research was indisputable. It had been replicated by multiple agencies across the globe. Dr. Lewis was right. Clearly, these peaks were not all benign. If these chemicals were all appearing in river samples, then were they getting into our drinking water as well? Some of your chemicals are starting to come off. But so each we, of those peaks is a chemical. The whole, this whole area underneath here is probably 200 different chemicals are coming off right now. This sample was from my own tap water in California. It turns out that there is a way you can identify some of the peaks. The sample can be run against a huge database of chemicals. And sometimes, you can find a match. So we tested downstream of the chemical valley. If we did find a chemical of concern, I believe that Dr. Gupta and possibly Randy Huffman would help us, proving that regulators can put science before politics. Now, there were other chemicals found. This is the one that I thought was the most concerning of the bunch. It says 1122-tetrachloroethane. Uh, um, it has a quality match of 96. That we found in four of the five locations. It's three to four times more toxic than MCHM. California considers it to be a carcinogen, a, a little less than one part per billion. But what I'm really trying to understand is, is, like, is this a big deal or not? These are small numbers, but they're significant numbers to my mind, you know. This is coming out of the water plant in Huntington. What? I didn't realize those were drinking water samples. Yeah, it's a huge deal. So the analytics were done by USGS labs? Yeah. They do great science. The lead chemist who did this research, he has 130 scientific papers published. He felt very confident that this chemical was there. One of the guys who used to work for me is a PhD chemist. Uh, he seems to think it's real. I mean, I expected to be uh, unconvinced. I did too. I'm not. I'm, I'm convinced, you know. It's, yeah. it's real. So have we yes. gone upstream? We didn't find any high concentrations of this in our river testing. But, but it could be leaching out of soil, couldn't it? It doesn't mean it was right. dumped. Well, that doesn't mean it's still not a crisis. Because if it's happened this time, it's happened in the past, mm -hmm. and it will happen again in the future. If you, if you had buy-in from state agencies, tell the public about this, and that would be good if they play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Jeff McIntyre is the president of oh, West Virginia right. American yeah, Water. Right, right, right. I think you need to give them a shot. So I sent an email to the key players in American water, but hadn't heard back. Looks like reception's locked. That's weird, it's the middle of a work day. Okay. I am here to speak to either Laura Jordan or Jeff McIntyre about some uh, data regarding uh, a chemical in the water. They're behind closed doors. Can you have uh, one of them give me a call back? I just need to be able to share this data with um, somebody who can look at it and make an informed decision, so. So these concentrations pretty much match what we found in the river. So Both. you found it in taps too? Yeah, correct. We weren't able to pinpoint a source, so thinking maybe it's due to rainfall. Well, you didn't sample in the Ohio River. No, I haven't done that yet, so that'd be something that'd be really good to do, especially after everything thaws. We just don't know. We just gotta do a little bit, little, do some research and see what we see what we find, mm -hmm. and if we can find anything. Yeah. Are, do you have any plans to, re, to uh, share this information with our state, with our health department, for Bureau of Public Health? I mean, I, you know, they regulate drinking water. Well, I sent Dr. Gupta all of the data. He hasn't made time yet, so. A big event was planned under the shadow of the Capitol to celebrate safe water. Dr. Gupta and the president of West Virginia American Water were both keynote speakers. How much information is to be shared? Data is power. But data has to be done, again, in a transparent, clear manner, but in also in a deliberate manner. When I, we don't know something, I will tell you we don't know it. Thank you for having me today. 
Sam Agamora says on the test it's non-detect already. Mm -hmm. so we've got the results already. Well, yeah, but what's the minimum detection limit? I don't know what that is. I haven't seen the results, but it's but really pretty low. But that's really important. Yeah. All I know with a very high degree of certainty is that it was in the water two months ago. Like if you had someone from your department go and run Why tests on the test. Why testing without, first of all, analyzing the data that's available? I mean, you seem to claim you have data available. I, I mean, I send you all the data, yeah. Right. We need to have ask you some questions about collection methodology, production protocols, transportation methods. But, we have but if the chemical is in fact there, then it's something that requires a degree of, of speed. Do you think that the public should at least have the ability to make a decision about this from the available data? No. About I would not tell the people of Huntington. It would only be carefully disseminated information that explains exactly what we know and exactly what we don't know. It would be sending us an unregulated chemical. It's, it's monitored on a regular basis, and it, it meets all of the rules that are, are in place at this time. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. I do think people have a right to know if any substances are going to end up in their drinking water. I think people do have a right to know that up front, whether these substances are classified as hazardous or non-hazardous. In the coming days, his department would look for any holes they could find in our data, implying that we had somehow added this chemical into the samples ourselves. Behind the scenes, officials had already cast so much doubt, the local press seemed nervous to run the story. It was hard to blame them, as it reminded me of something Dr. Edwards had said. You know, you have to fight this on your own because uh, who else wants to pay a price? I had exhausted every option okay. except for one. Hold that for one sec. Yeah. Uh, while we wait for those answers to come in, uh, I have an announcement to make. So uh, four months ago, I went down the Kanawha River and I took samples. It was an audience full of health department and water company employees. I hoped that maybe they would respond to facts. These tests came back um, at a range of between 0.5 and 0.85 parts per billion. These levels are not considered to be safe in eight states in this country. This should warrant further investigation by your state officials. Thank you. So I think it's kind of reprehensible to come up and make a statement when you think you're sure. And I can tell you I am sure. And there is no concern with the Huntington water supply related to that chemical. Imagine if officials had waited two months after the original spill they wouldn't have found anything. Not to mention that the soil was now frozen. To my knowledge, no testing by the regulatory agencies was ever done. The carcinogen I had brought attention to in West Virginia, it was just the one chemical that we could detect. And it was unregulated, so legally, it could be in the water. But there were still thousands of chemicals that the system couldn't find a match for. Chemicals you couldn't smell. And we don't know if they're harmful or not, because the studies are all confidential, and the science could be fake, like it was with MCHM. Besides, who's going to look for something that they don't want to find? Changing culture, um, both industry and government, is a tough thing. It's not easy. I mean, I'm really working to change the culture within our side of it, and yeah. it, it, it's not that easy. Why do we want a villain? We can exonerate ourselves, in our own minds anyway, if there's a villain. That's why it's so easy to be a victim. Science is based completely on trust. If scientists and engineers are untrustworthy, uh, the public will turn against us, and I think it's already happening. And they will turn to other sources of authority who are historically less reliable. You could enter a new dark age. Failed environmental leadership has contributed to two of the worst government-created environmental disasters in decades, which have undermined the American people's faith in the agency. This is why I believe Trump nominated Attorney General Pruitt to serve as the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Mr. Pruitt, you have sued the EPA 19 times to stop clean air and water protections. Do you believe there is any safe level of lead? Senator, uh, that's something I've not reviewed nor, nor know about. I've not looked at the scientific uh, research on that. In 2017, Scott Pruitt, the new head of the EPA, 
began dismantling his own agency. We are going to end the EPA intrusion into your lives. He fired nearly everyone on the Independent Scientific Advisory Board, then began removing scientific research from public view. This is a wholesale wiping out of historical record, the science that we've developed and the actions we've taken and why we took them. You can disagree with many of those actions, but what you can't do is simply deny history. It was the culmination of regulators behaving unethically of politicians leveraging science for their own benefit, of the public losing trust in a broken system. But science isn't broken, which means the system can be rebuilt. But until that happens, it's probably best you remember that we're all downstream of something. Sir, are you going to plead guilty? We've got to quit politicizing either side and get back to the science. Well, that was all right. Each of these individuals attempted to bury or cover up the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Sure.